Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, the weather is with us. It's a nice, nippy evening, not too cold, not too hot. Um, <laughs> Kaiwan is very, very cold. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, this is a, a, an evening put together thanks to Andrea. Um, Andrea and I go back many, many years, and, and when I got to know that Andrea is now a new um, Italian Cultural Center director, it was just smile through and through on my face. Um, and now we're collaborating a lot with Italian Cultural Center. The exhibition that you see in the Central Hall has come all the way from Maxim Museum Rome, and people who's the, uh, the curator of Maxim Museum um, architecture uh, uh, is here with us today. Um, and I'm going to now pass the mic to Andrea. Thank you all. Thank you for being with us today. Hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Namaste. Benvenuti. Um, I won't talk about the exhibition, as we are having here Pete Pochorra, who has been curating the exhibition, together with our two curators. Um, I want to say just two words about um, about the fact that I, I've been directing the Cultural Center for the past three months in a country where I spent um, more than a half of my life. So it's, um, it's something very, uh, very important and very meaningful to me. And the first thing I thought as, a, as an aim uh, for this Cultural Center was to create a platform where Indians and Italians uh, passionate about certain cultural, poetical, political issues could come together and developing um, a dialogue. So tonight I'm particularly happy and also feel a bit emotional because I'm seeing friends after a long time. And um, the idea was that uh, together with the exhibition, you know, exhibitions are very, they're very important moment, and they're made out of things that have the, um, has a role to play, and they have to speak for something. But nothing like seeing people in real and sharing thoughts, maybe triggered by what we see in the exhibitions, or triggered by the simple fact of being together to tackle certain issues, I thought that that would have been um, the real beautiful things that this exhibition could generate. And that's where I called Kaiwan. We wouldn't have been already involved in the past in few in other projects. And, uh, and then slowly, by talking to each other, we came to this idea of not having a discussion between architects, but tackling these um, issues from different voices. And uh, the rest is for all of us to discover tonight. Okay. We'll inaugurate it. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks to the Italian Cultural Center for having all of us here, the Italian Embassy and the Maxim Museum for bringing this exhibition to India, to Delhi. And thank you, Amit and Stir, for having us all this evening here in this wonderful setting, cold as it may be for a Bombay boy. But thank you very, very much. Uh, when Andrea and myself spoke about this exhibition uh, for the first time, and although one could see a certain kind of a sensitivity and thoughtfulness uh, to an age-old question, not, not age-old in that sense, but an old question, which needs to be asked again and again, no doubt about that. But the question is, how would we ask this question of women in architecture? or women, or gender, and a particular kind of a practice. I think it, it raises 
two levels of questions. One is it brings in a whole world of histories that have dealt with the question of gender, women, the way our societies are structured, the problems, how different people have dealt with them over the years, over generations, over histories. So I think gender is a, is a recurring kind of a conversation and it, it needs to be recurring because I think with passing time, we will sort of shift, shift questions. And it's not about resolving a question all the time, but it's about keeping the question alive because it allows us to negotiate some of the difficult spaces then. But on the other hand, it is also the question of a practice and maybe a practice like architecture. And practices itself are not stable. In fact, I think personally for me, uh, and it's also showing up much more in my life as an educator, as to what does it mean to train someone to be an architect? What is it that this person is going to have as skills, as abilities, abilities to think, abilities to act, abilities to intervene in a social space, in a cultural space, as a quote-unquote architect? What will this word architect or architecture mean? And I think in, in passing and hearing one of the interviews, I think it was, if, I'm, if I remember right, it was Beatrice Colomina who said that with architects doing many things like curating exhibitions, working as parallel lives as artists, etc., that word itself is fragile, fragile today. So I think there are, there are histories that practices, uh, practices have. And as much as there have been very important attempts in, in India, right from uh, Brinda Somaya and her colleagues, or Mary Woods, or Madhvi Desai, who have tried to account for what it has meant to be women practitioners, or women practice, or women-led practices, or women in the practice of architecture. I think very often we have produced a certain kind of a roster, but one has sort of landed up in questions, then that get, get repeated. They often sort of even repeat a stereotype does the nature of a woman practice, uh, influence a practice? Is there a question of tenderness? But then you say, am I sort of getting into stereotype roles when I talk about tenderness or when I talk about how do you deal with labor? And I think it was, it was these kind of thoughts that also brings to a broader question as to, don't we all have particularities? Whether it is the question of gender, whether it is a kind of a city that we come from, whether it is a family structure that we grow out from. And I think in many ways there are these particularities that all of us grow with. There are some particularities that are not normative, they get othered, and we as individuals have to make extra efforts to negotiate with them. But ultimately all of us are thrown into a certain kind of an everyday life. I thought today would be a good evening to sort of extend that exhibition because that exhibition in many ways has very simple narrations of people's everyday lives as an architect, as being somebody in a particular country, in a particular context at some point in time. And I thought this panel discussion could precisely be that extension in person where we could have different kinds of practitioners simply talking what it means to be a practitioner today. In our engagements of everyday life, our practices become very important. What is the sensitivity that we bring to our practice? What is the thought process that I bring to my practice? Do I bring a thought process to my practice as every editor or every teacher is supposed to bring? Or there is something else that I negotiate as an individual? So our individual subjectivities also lend to a sense of what may be quote unquote good or quote unquote critical practices. And that's how we sort of also landed up uh, simply putting a title that sounds very generic, but I think has, has, a lot of, has a lot of weight into it, the way you think about it, what makes a critical intervention into societies that we live today, because it is necessary that we see practice as a ground of action and not practice as simply a ground of production. And there is a difference between production and action. And at this point, I, I sort of leave my opening remarks here. It's wonderful to have the curator of the original exhibition with us. And I would request him to begin by telling us the way they put this exhibition together. And a particular question, good news. We need genuine good news today. So if you could talk about this, please.
Thank you. First of all, congratulations to this beautiful setting and space and gallery. Like a, for a tribute to my friend Jean-Louis Cohen, who died this summer, Jean-Louis Cohen used to say, exhibitions are the most public moment for architecture. First, first of all, good news. I, I'm, I'm very good at title. Basically, it's the only thing I can do. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very good. So if you need it, I'm very good at titles. Uh, so I wanted to call this show "Good News." The second thing I never wanted the word "women" in the title, but I was threatened to be fired from the museum if I didn't put the word "women" in the title, which in the end worked very well, of course, in communication terms. My idea, just to pick up from where you stop, was to find a way to understand how the architecture practice and discipline is changing through this frame of the gender and women story. Maybe we could even divide. Uh, the exhibition is organized in four sections. Very simple. The first section is historical. Uh, Bios, uh, a long research, we went, in, in Rome we had like 100 stories because they were not only Italians. Going from the first architecture graduate in the 1890s in Finland to young designers that you see here, there are not even 30, which is, which is good news. Um, second, so this is on the tables, very, very simply. Of course, it's a traveling exhibition, so you don't have big models, you don't have uh, it's an open, it's an open table you, where you can gather around. This is Matilde Cassani, uh, who designed the exhibition idea. Is to have like dinner table where people could meet. So first, first part is stories. So good news meant buone notizie, no? It meant literally good news, but in Italian has a beautiful double sense because it also means new and good. So it's not only good news, but the, new, the news we get are good. So the new architects are good. So nuove e buone e nuove e buone nuove, basically. Uh, so, in the, so history in the tables, that the second section is about um, important international architects working in Italy. This could not, could, this could be there or not, but it was important for us also to look into, in Rome we had 12 of them, and it was exactly what you said before, how the practice is changing. The, the mapping of different approach to the profession, uh, seeing the, the offices led by women or by couples or by a couple of women, like the Grafton, has like a, an avant-garde of this. So this was really one of the parts. Uh, and I also have to say the show was not created only by me. Actually, I was the only man in a team of 30 women and two co-curators, Elena and Elena, I have to say. Uh, so we had the stories. We had the, the big stars around. Then we wanted to hear the voices. So we asked, yes, even Beatriz, but also uh, 12 yes. of opinion leaders from Phyllis Lambert, who just turned 97, as we all know, and she's still alive and very kicking, uh, to people that are 29, 30 years old and practicing architect. So, voices. And then we also selected five extremely young teams through an European program we participate, and they directly work on the issue of gender and space. So they produce video. We do this film school every year at Maxi with young architects who want to learn the, the medium, and we produce videos with them. So the show is like this. But I think what is important is, it's not only a, about women architects. I mean, the, this women story was a very good frame to understand what's happening in the architecture world today. And I think maybe, I mean, we are, we're all in crisis. I live in a museum. I'm, I'm, a prof I'm an academic, I'm, I was an architect. Sometimes I'm secretly an architect <laughs> still now, but nobody knows it. Uh, I, I, I write because my, probably my only skill is writing, besides titles. And, 
Um, but we are, it's very difficult because I am sitting in these days on the jury for the Miss Van der Rohe Prize. And the, the war between the archie lovers and the archie haters in a jury today is violent. So what do you have to do? You have to support the Beatrice kids who want to say the architects are only curators? <laughs> or you support the guys in Harvard or who still teach them to do beautiful architecture? Mm -hmm. Who's designing the houses people will live? So we live in this struggle today. So I think that to put the light on this, uh, the work, of, because, and women are really evolving no, in this situation. Mm -hmm. So how they address this situation, for me, is super interesting. And so that's why we did the show. The show, as both you and Andrea said, is just the beginning mm. for a possible investigation and conversation. But I'm very happy we did it. Thank you so, so very much. I think that's also the nature of practice and architecture, that it allows these kind of flows, even across places, because your ideas are talking to, talking to each other. So thank you very much. But I think the way you described this question of the woman uh, or women becoming this lens, but the question is the stories. And I'm really happy that, that Chitra and Shimul both agreed to be on this, be on this panel. Let me, let me then uh, start by inviting Chitra to speak about what it has mean to shape the kind of practice that, that she has shaped, also to give a bit of a context. Uh, the, the work that Chitra and her team uh, has been, or her office has been doing, in my, in my reading, grew out of sensitivities even before the world was sort of dancing around the bonfire called sustainability. Hopefully that story, some bit of it, we will get Chitra from you today. Thank you. Now? Yes. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> it's yeah. good news now. <laughs> yeah. But, but for me, a lot of my practice now I see in the hindsight, when I was working, it was in a flow. It was, I must say that I had a problem of the plenty. So one had to really, at the same time, do something like 10 houses at a time. That's how it's been with us. And these are small projects. And they were within the city. I had no time to read anything else or see criticism of architecture. But this was in a space where in Bangalore, especially I think we should give the credit to the city and the people there, that they demanded a designed house within a very, really small plot and tight budgets. And all these th things are really very wicked combination, and it doesn't give you any time to introspect or check yourself with your colleagues, like you were saying, in the, in the clique. And just because there was so much work, you were deep within it. Uh, I was deep within it, and I would be just there. And at the same time, you're working, the work was a lot more crafted or needed people, people who had a different skill. And you had to retain that skill. So that required that you kept working. And that's what it was for at least 15 years. Till when said, oh, this is our practice. This is our um, ethos, where we are working for the crises the city gives you. And then with that, you design. So architecture, the kind of material we want to use, water, waste, all of it kind of came in. And that's when we also changed our name of the practice from the totally uncreative name earlier was Chitra Vishnath Architects, because we didn't have any, right? To Biome Environmental Solutions, but yes. Because we're bringing in all of this together. I think what I see as being a woman has been that I didn't have this whole uh, that ego architect bit. No? So I never subscribed to Fountainhead. I 
could never do that. I read that, but could <laughs> never think of working that. Yeah. yeah. And so it was also sharing, sharing what's happening, the power, sharing with people, the knowledge, and basically sharing the power that uh, now in the office, and I'm very happy about that because it gives me a lot of time to do other things like coming here, but that many of the, many of the clients don't even know who I am. So I can just walk in and out, they don't, they probably think she didn't serve me the tea, but that's fine. And they talk to my younger colleagues, and it is because of that, I feel it's because of that, that this practice, like uh, Kaiwan said, which works on sustainability, which that's not the word I use, but it's been there for past three plus decades. Doing the same thing, trying to introspect at every moment of what we are doing, and that's been they're now in almost everybody in the office. So. Yeah, just a quick comment before I pass on that. It was beautiful that you said that you didn't have time to introspect, but there's a lot of introspection which you agreed to towards the end of your yeah. talk. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah, there yeah. is introspection, but in that but sense, the busyness. The busyness at that time couldn't, couldn't. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there are many things you felt that you're not part and I have been told also that that's not architecture the kind of work Chitra is doing, it's not because it's a small house. It's just about 1,000 square feet of house. It's made with stabilized earth blocks, and she talks about water and stuff. That's not architecture, because architecture was what came in AR and other magazines, and you, know, you had to do that. But I didn't have time. So I didn't even feel bad that I'm not in the clique. But there was a, there was a kind of a Maybe in maybe certain crisis pushed you towards that, as you said. There has been a kind of experimenting, like with your own house or yeah. doing things in your own house, and a little bit on that, if you could quickly. Yeah. So, but you know, you make your own house and you try to push, and that's the only place you want to push. And it, you make you can make mistakes in your own house. And when you make mistakes in your ha own house, you learn from it and you're able to do it in your designs better. But it's, I really love my own house, you know? <laughs> I really love it, and especially after the pandemic, even more, because I've, I think that's the time, those two years was that I spent maximum time inside my own house. But it, it, uh, it grows with you. It grew, grew with our ideas, whether it was the first time, how do I get earth to build with? And that's a design and is the worst basement ever designed. That's the one I did for my own house. But then you really enjoyed the house during the summer of the pandemic. And you said, yeah. So now it's the whole idea is that we suggest basements <laughs> because of the urban heat. You know, This is a place where you should be. You should have more underground structures. So similarly with water, and then what kind of drinking water do you secure? Or you grow food. We grow rice on our terrace with um, our own human <laughs> waste. I don't know. So things like these keep happening in our own house. And that gets stretched, that gets designed, that gets drawn, that gets detailed in the office and it goes further and becomes a way of doing design in biome. But I also have to say there was there was a beautiful moment we shared when both of us were teaching, not together in a sense simultaneously studios at SEPT. This was the Similar pandemic, ones, yeah. 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 And I used to invite or I invited her as a jury. But even besides that, she would come and sit when we had open reviews, saying, "I don't know what I'm doing in my studio, but I want to see what you're doing in your <laughs> studio." And I, I thought that was beautiful to sort of, for a person at, 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 at a seniority that she is, to sort of have that, be able to say that, and also have the time to come and sit at somebody else's studio just to listen. Uh, Shimul, if I can come to you uh, now. And um, in your practice, I think there is, a, there is a kind of slow sensitivity that I've always, uh, always observed. If you could talk about how this practice has come to what it is today and, and your approach to the buildings that you've worked on. 
Thanks, Kevin. You, you speak about that. You, you need to bring your child in while there's a meeting uh, going on. The child is in the frame. Um, all this has been fairly obvious and uh, mm. encouraged. And I think that's what uh, increasingly women have seen and been attracted to. And so we've had some very, very good talent come through our doors. Um, yeah, I'd say that's more or less uh, my take on, on the practice. If there's anything more you want me to mention, Kevan, or anything you'd like to ask. Thanks. Thanks, Shimul. Uh, yes, it, in a sense, uh, I'll just pick up on that, not by design, but maybe by a particular culture of the way the office runs, including the lunch, which is sort of uh, cooked, in the, cooked in the office or brought to the office and people don't have to bring a dabba which again for a lot of people saves that little amount of time when you're rushing uh, in the morning, especially with a Bombay yes, kind of... Yes, uh, yes. Thanks, so, Kevin. I, I kind of left that out. But, but yeah, yeah we, and I've at, been at part of point, that very often. So. And, and yeah, and not only is there a common lunch uh, that is served by the office, we do a very interesting thing at lunch, which is, uh, it's called videos at lunch. And mm -hmm. every individual in the office has a day uh, they show a video of anything that is interesting to them. It need not be architectural and it can, you know, uh, be a five to 15 minute film. And then we all discuss it. Uh, and I think one of the things that helped me shape my practice was deciding what to say no to. So slowly we stopped doing any kind of residential interiors. We were doing, um, and, and that was a tough one in Bombay where there's, very little, I mean, that's the low hanging fruit. Um, and uh, I, I found that clients who I had done something small for kept giving me larger projects and generally projects outside of India. And I think the fun part is each time you close a door, a new one opens up. And I think that's what happened with our practice. What I also found is that one can be fairly. Um, fairly subversive uh, with, with practice and uh, I, I, we've often, like you said, with the buildings for religious tourism, we've often taken uh, projects that uh, are overtly religious and either try to bring out the extremely spiritual within them or, uh, you know, attempted to somehow build community with those. So, uh, just that word religion, for instance, uh, we have attempted to articulate in many different ways, other than the more overt ways that are, you know, becoming increasingly political today. Um, we, we've attempted to do that, whether it comes to a home uh, and in how a family integrates and comes to Together. We do very few homes, but uh, we've attempted to do that with all of our buildings. Um, but I guess, uh, Kevin, one of the things you're referring to is also the culture of the office, which is, uh, I think, highly democratic and uh, something that we, we instituted. I mean, just two years ago, we became a, a partnership practice where three other women who have been part of this practice for the last uh, 20 years are now partners. And, uh, you know, we, we all work together. There's a lot of uh, a lot of teamwork. Yes, it is mostly a, uh, a women-oriented practice. And I think that's, when I say it's not by design, I think it's more by empathy. Because the practice has always been known to encourage kids coming in, encourage a fair amount of honesty, um, you know, honesty just in terms of uh, if you can't, you can't make it because a relative is unwell, you, you speak about that. If you need to bring your child in while there's a meeting uh, going on, the child is in the frame. Um, all this has been fairly obvious and uh, encouraged and I think that's what uh, increasingly women have seen and been attracted to and so we've had some very very good talent come through our doors um, yeah I'd say that's more or less 
uh, my take on, on the practice, if there's anything more you want me to mention, Tehran, or anything you'd like to ask. Thanks, thanks Shibul. Uh, yes, it, in a sense, uh, I'll just pick up on that, not by design, but maybe by a particular culture of the way the office runs, including the lunch, which is sort of uh, cooked, in the, cooked in the office or brought to the office and people don't have to bring a tapa which again for a lot of people saves that little amount of time when you're rushing uh, in the morning, especially with the Bombay Yes, kind of, uh, yes. Thank so, you, Devon. I, I kind of left that out. But, but yeah, yeah we, and I think at, part at of point, that very we, often so. And yeah, not only is there a common lunch uh, that is served by the office, we do a very interesting thing at lunch, which is, uh, it's called videos at lunch. And every individual in the office has a day uh, they show a video of anything that is interesting to them. It need not be architectural and it can, you know, uh, be a 5 to 15 minute film and then we all discuss it. And we found that very, very useful in beginning to understand um, each one's interests and in beginning to understand each one's position and being able to discuss these positions. We, uh, we found, uh, you know, several women who at some point left to start their own practices or do a master's of their own uh, ha had mentioned that these were very, very formative conversations for them. It really helped them to grow in maturity and thought. And I thought that was wonderful. Thanks, thanks Shibul. Shibul, one more aspect I wanted uh, you to maybe briefly speak about is, and I, I've experienced this personally in two sort of relationships with you. One is maybe as an editor, as an architecture critic, when one has come to your office, very often you have invited uh, me to your office uh, to comment or discuss a project. And you know, I remember the last time when we did this during the pandemic, we did it over two sessions because we somehow didn't finish it in the, in the one hour that we had allotted for it. So this sense of listening to what somebody is saying, even every time I came for another meeting to your office, you would quickly sort of share a project and would sort of listen. And I, I can see that also with some of your other colleagues who, I'm, who I've known, for example, I've known your colleague Sarika as my junior at school, and I can see the way she sometimes reflects or talk on architecture. So, uh, and in the other role that we've, that we've played, uh, which maybe probably was a nightmare for you, which was getting me to write a book on, on Mr. Kadri. Uh, but I, I've always sort of appreciated the role you played there which was that, that there was a space given to me as a writer and you would sort of listen, including Mr. Kadri, Rahul, all of you, there was a space of listening that was very useful for me as a writer that you offered or all of you offered. So uh, this question of empathy and this question of listening, if, if, if you feel like reflecting on, on these two things. I think it's... Uh... It may have begun with me, but it, uh, it's definitely the DNA of the office where um, we believe there is that's something special in every single human being and we need to simply un uncover it and sometimes in the most difficult of times um, <laughs> where we really have to dig deep. Uh, but yes, we do faith. Uh, there is this belief that um, kind of the kingdom of God lies in every human being and it needs to be, um, one needs to have a listening attitude to be able to uh, bring that in. I'd also say that um, I have a huge curiosity about human beings and maybe that, that's what helps. But I think it's really become the DNA of the office. Uh, people join uh, and either grow into it or join because of it and those that, that don't probably don't enjoy the office as much. Uh, but there is something I wanted to say on this whole, whole thing on women. Should I say it now or please, please would should. you like to? Say it now. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what I do feel is uh, it, it's been, this whole revelation of gender as a continuum has been wonderful. I think that's really the minute that binary goes of male and female, it just makes uh, makes the whole the, the dilemma that you talked about earlier 
that is this women centric design uh, do women have a different take on architecture uh, all that just becomes much simpler when you begin to understand gender as a continuum and and you know that's that there is a certain amount of maleness and women and womanness and men and yes. Uh, uh, it, it, you don't have to be one or the other. And then what you're really bringing to your architecture is, like you say, your stories, your uh, your social upbringing, your social and environmental upbringing. Great. Thanks, Shiv. Yeah. That, was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. All of us were nodding our heads. Even if you couldn't see us nodding our heads. Yeah, yeah. But thank you, thank you so much for making that statement. Uh, we believe there is that something special in every single human being, and we need to simply un uncover it, and sometimes in the most difficult of clients, uh, <laughs> where we really have to dig deep. Um, but yes, we do feel uh, there is this belief that. Um, kind of the kingdom of God lies in every human being and it needs to be, um, it, one needs to have a listening attitude to be able to uh, bring that in. I'd also say that um, I have a huge curiosity about human beings and maybe that, that's what helps, but I think it's really become the DNA of the office. Um, people join uh, and either grow into it or join because of it and those that, that don't probably don't enjoy the office as much. Uh, but there is something I wanted to say on this whole, whole thing on women. Should I say it now or please, please would you like to? Say it now, so, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what I do feel is uh, it, it's been this whole revelation of gender as a continuum has been wonderful. I think that's really the minute that binary goes of male and female, it just makes uh, makes the whole the, the dilemma that you talked about earlier that is this women centric design mm. uh, do women have a different take on architecture uh, all that just becomes much simpler when you begin to understand gender as a continuum and and you know that's that there is a certain amount of maleness in women and womanness and men and um, it, it, you, you don't have to be one or the other. other. And then what you're really bringing to your architecture is, like you say, your stories, your, um, your social upbringing, your social and an environmental upbringing. Thanks, Shavu. Yeah. That, was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. All of us were nodding our heads, even if you couldn't see us nodding our heads. But thank you, thank you so much for making that statement. And Paramita, may I come to talking to you? I was really resonating a lot listening to Chitra speaking, for example, uh, because while in a totally different domain, the journey of like just working, 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 not really pausing to think, but thinking as you work, and work becoming your thinking, I think really did happen for me, partly because I lived in a city like Bombay where you don't have the luxury to ruminate unless you live, you know, in an old rented apartment <laughs> that your liberal elite parents yeah. rented at the right moment in history, right? So, so you know, I lived in tenement housing and I, I, I did whatever I needed to do in order to do the kind of work I wanted to do. So that also took me out of my expected space and therefore expected way of thinking. But one thing I feel, because you are talking about women or identities that are marginalized in some way, uh, what is it that that experience lends you? And I think when you are outside of a structure, you, ca you recognize the architecture of that structure. From the outside, you suddenly think like, this is just a construct, mm. this thing which won't let me come in. So uh, for example, uh, there will be many uh, women and maybe some queer people who've had this experience that you know, you meet somebody, they take so much interest in you and they say, you're so interesting. <laughs> Kiss of death. Because when somebody says you're so interesting, you think they're saying, I'm so interested in you. But actually, it's not. You're interesting because you're not the normal box that I'm going to check because I want to be normal, right? So it's not me. It's the structures keeping me and many other people outside of it. 
And then you, what have you recognized at that moment? You've recognized how power functions in unspoken ways, right? In some ways, you, uh, you recognize that in the space which is supposedly alternative, there are many standard power structures actually operating right, very right, strongly. Right. These are questions of class and caste, of course. Uh, you come from that class, but if you don't perform your own class correctly, <laughs> it's a very big problem. So I would say that, you know, for me, my practice is shaped very much as being against respectability. Because I saw the respectability at the heart of liberal politics, and I just felt like, whatever, this is just another way of mm -hmm. having power, and mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of shifts that were occurring in Indian society. 1991, we have liberalization. Absolutely. And as a young person, you're seeing political realities and mm -hmm. conversations change. I mean, it's very naive to imagine that the India we live in today didn't start happening very long ago. Absolutely. But you know, the way in which people paid attention to certain processes and not to other processes. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the kind, what liberalization, how it took apart the working person's life. Mm -hmm. And how focused liberal elites were only on certain processes at that time, and not at all speaking about class and workers and all mm. of that, right? Mm. So I think my neighbors were bar dancers. So it was very interesting because as a feminist, you think you're very countercultural, then you meet the bar dancer and you discover all <laughs> kinds of squeamishness in yourself. So there's also push back to your self image mm. that comes from your class and your liberalness, right? So all in all, I would say that my practice to some extent got defined by my being able to trust. And that I don't know why I could do. That is a biographical or personality thing that I trusted my experiential truths. I may have suffered because of them. Mm. I may have felt sometimes I'm not good enough to belong. Uh, but I, I trusted my experiential uh, feeling. I love something. Mm. It's worth loving because I love it. Nice. Somebody else may not think it's worth loving, but I do think it's worth loving. And that is actually the experience of all of us who don't tightly belong, right? So if I have to define my practice in retrospect, which is one of the few good things about growing older, uh, <laughs> that you have retrospective view. It was really a search for a non-binary practice, for a non-binary politics. Right? I, wa I, I didn't want to define politics in the way it's uh, traditionally defined, mm -hmm. as being against something, as being about impossibility, as being about danger and difficulty and you can't do, so you must break that structure down and replace it with your structure. Right. But I was actually interested in possibilities, where are the possibilities? Who is doing what? What is being enabled? How are people making things possible for themselves? And how can I be with those people? Actually, that's what it is. And that automatically meant a little, doing a little bit of what Shimul said, right? That the kind of towering masculine figure in documentary or alternative or liberal arts, the man with the beard, shorn of pleasure, telling us all <laughs> what to think, Boring us, but we are pretending we are not bored because we are in the presence of the great man. We'll work for him free. We'll get a thrill being in his presence. I didn't feel that way. I felt I'm pretty thrilling myself. You know, <laughs> I mean, like, I remember once being at a party and Abbas Tarawala, the writer, I mean, I was pretty drunk, but he asked, and therefore I told the truth. So he asked me this question. Parmita, you're so... I mean, the question is always, you know, you could be doing something greater, why aren't you? You're so smart. Like, people always ask me that. So he's like, Parmita, don't you wish you were writing a feature? Don't you want to make a Hindi film because it's more glamorous? So I said, no, I think I'm already glamorous. <laughs> I think Bollywood will become more glamorous if I enter. I'm not sure I can handle it. And I completely meant it at that moment. Right? <laughs> so I think, like, you know, actually, actually, this is a strange thing. Maybe it's a kind of a queerness, you don't have to be LGBT to be queer in that sense, right? right, right. It's a queer kind of thinking where you feel like it's pretty amazing that we are able to have the life that we have and what is making it possible? Mm. And how can we connect with others who are doing this? And how can we share in these pleasures in order to make sense of the pain rather than just all the time be making sense of pain and never acknowledging sure, sure. that pleasure is also present in life and what makes life possible, right? So I think that's also why I've had this very kind of itinerant career uh, that working in documentary and as soon as it started to stabilize mm -hmm. and I started to be in danger of becoming a bearded man, <laughs> then the, th the thing of shifting to something in which like suddenly you do some television show. So I've quite liked starting over and over in a completely unknown space mm -hmm. and uh, actually finding the politicalness in that. Uh, recognizing the politicalness of the everyday as opposed to fitting the everyday into a pre-existing canonical frame, right? Mm. Like mm. that. 
But every experience, every experience is on the same plane. So your intimate life has led to a certain understanding Absolute. of the world. Yes. yes. Whatever that understanding, you are sharing it with the community, and the community is taking away from it and building on their own they whatever own. it is they build, right? So I think that's one kind of frame. Pleasure is another such frame, because in pleasure, we cannot assume what the other person mm. finds pleasurable. Everything is different in pleasure. What food you like, it is decided by your identity, but also by your individuality. So for us to understand each other's pleasure is also an act of negotiation in which we must treat each other as equals mm -hmm. and not go by identity. So I'm very keen on those frames. And that's why I also like the song as a frame. Because the song is an inclusive frame. Everybody can sing it. Everybody may not like it, but everybody can, can sing, sing it, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Paramita. Thank you. That brings me to you, Arpita. So what, it, what has it been to sort of uh, A, be an independent publisher, but B, also to sort of constantly intervene in this manner of life through the acts of publishing books? Thanks, Kaiban. Um, uh, first of all, listening to all these wonderful speakers and also being asked to speak at the end means I have reflected so much in the last 40 minutes on so many of these questions. And it's actually very, very helpful for me because we've just entered the 20th year of Yoda Press. So it's one of those milestone years where you're supposed to sit back and you know reflect on what you've done right and what you've done wrong. And it's nice to have these opportunities. When you ask a question like this, first of all, there's just so many things that one wants to talk about, and there's so much that Chitra said, and Shimul said, and Paro said, which resonates so deeply with me in the way, uh, you know, one has tried to publish books, nurture relationships with authors, continue the conversation after the book has come out, mm. like with us. Um, very often, they've turned into friendships. Um, but it's, it's also about, I think where it all comes from is, um, and I was thinking this just this morning because someone was asking me about this, that, you know, a lot of people will say Yoda Press doesn't have a focus. Like, Zuban we know is feminist books and Navayana we know is on caste. And, but you, you guys sort of, you know, crisscross a lot. You have for 20 years. And I've always sort of said, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an alternative to the mainstream which is what we're trying to build lists in. Um, and I think younger people have taught me to use the word intersectional very strategically now, because they said, you know, what you've been doing is actually intersectional, so why don't you say it? But um, I think this morning I was thinking, what is at the nub of it is, I think, a, a very solid belief that my bubble however privileged it is, my family, is, it is truly what great philosophers have said before us, uh, the intelligent ones. Um, it is truly the smallest unit of the state. And uh, when we talk about things like patriarchy, or we talk about casteism, or we talk about um, you know, a, a kind of having an intolerant attitude towards gender or, or not seeing gender as a spectrum, not uh, sexism or toxic masculinity. The most comfortable resting ground for all of these things are in our families, in our homes. Um, and perhaps in South Asia that is truer than in many other parts of the world. And so for me, it's about what is the conversation that is going to push back on that front. What is the conversation that's going to say, A, acknowledge this, check this and say, yes, this is a fact, and then push back. And push back within families, within homes. You know, it's not just uh, something that, and this, I suppose this idea of the personal is political is, is deeply felt by me. And I think it's something that, you know, uh, one of the things Shimul was saying, this idea of, uh, you don't just work together, you're a community. So you are constantly also discussing um, and negotiating your own crises, your own sort of points of celebration, 
and that is not going to be siloed out as, oh, you don't bring all this to the office space, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think some of that, I mean, that's true of my uh, team as well, but I think some of that also, not some of that, a lot of that has made, has played a role in how I've negotiated with my authors. One of the things that, because we built so many narrative nonfiction manuscripts, mm -hmm. one of the things that I have, people always laugh because now they, they expect, they say it before I say it is, foreground yourself, talk about yourself. Don't try to keep yourself, you know, sort of invisible or above. Bring yourself into the narrative. Uh, locate yourself, check your privilege if you need to, or tell your story if you need to. Because what happens very often in uh, narratives that, 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 you know, that we have all grown up with, what are considered classics and iconic classics, is you never get to see who engendered that narrative. And that, I think that, that has, I think that is something that has always made authors and us sort of talk much more about each other's lives. That has led to a sense of spirit of collaboration, which, which is very important for me. Because I think without collaborations, you know, um, a publishing setup like mine, which is so independent, would not have survived for 20 years. It, that is, uh, you know, really key to our survival. And uh, collaboration comes out, I think, of having real and honest conversations and continuing conversations. Um, and, and that is something that's very, very important for us. Two things, Arpita. Uh, one is, uh, if you could speak more specifically to what it has meant to be a publisher in the sense of reading manuscripts after manuscripts and talking to authors. But before that, I want to also point out, you know, as compared to, uh, uh, for example, what Shimul was saying, uh, if, I may, if I may share this, you know, I've been privy to sort of seeing how Yoda Press has sort of been a s office. And I think I know that you've struggled whether there should be a physical space or not a physical space. There should be, should I be going to office? Should the office be coming to my house? Uh, should there be sort of flexible working hours or not flexible working hours? Should I have flexible hours but the office runs on time? In between you also experimented trying to put a bookshop together. At one point somebody would sort of said that, oh, it's, it's, it's a very rocky sort of a scenario. Maybe in retrospective I could compliment you saying that you worked with whatever structure at that point allowed you to continue doing your work. Can you please? Yeah, actually, that's a lovely uh, thing to talk about. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we are discussing, because we're now the team is discussing how we're going to celebrate 20 years. And one of the things we're discussing is that, that we have to have a special evening or afternoon for all the people who worked at Yoda Press over the 20 years. Because unlike many other offices, people who leave us don't stop being in touch with us. And at times, it becomes crazy. We have to have, we have these periodic, we call it the Yoda Press alumni meetups, you know. Whoever's in town, somebody will call and say, I'm in town, who else is in town? Can we all meet and we all talk about? And some of them have gone into publishing, some have gone and studied and uh, started teaching, but there is a continuing relationship. And I think one of the reasons that happened was because of this, of what you're saying. Because for me, it was very clear, you know, that um, it's not an ideal kind of, uh, of what's considered the corporate ideal, what a lot of other publishing houses will do. You have swanky premises or you have at least premises and you know you can sort of give this, have this kind of a, a very clear boundary or, or, or you know, uh, set out kind of a location for yourself. For us it's changed. I mean at one time we had the bookstore uh, for five years, Yodakin, and we had a little attic space above, which was an office. office. But I'll tell you, at that time, uh, Delhi University had just started something called Queer Campus. So every week, Queer Campus meetings used to happen in the attic, which is the office. All of us used to climb down uh, for those two hours, and the Queer Campus meeting used to happen there. So it, even within that, there was chaos. And I think somewhere, 
that has been the strength. I think the chaos uh, of the community that we, we, we managed to build has been our strength. And even today, I mean, 20 years later, first of all, it shocks me that we're still around and we're still publishing. I have a colleague who does not just work for me, but has just set up her own literary agency. And I have another colleague who works for me and then also runs a reading room. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it was always very clear that there was never going to be this, oh, this is going to be your only job and you're not going to do anything else and you've got to give all your time to this. And, um, and I think we all worked around that. And I get that support from my colleagues and I understand that, you know, that when I need to step in for them, um, uh, that's going to happen. And I, I mean, a lot of the time, I, I know that at times, therefore, there have been people who are saying, oh, is that even a serious office? I don't know. I think I'm kind of happy it's not a serious <laughs> office. It's a fun <laughs> office. <laughs> and the publisher, briefly on that. Publishing particular titles. Oh, gosh. See, 20th year, you shouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> Someone asked me, there was an interview this morning, and, I, uh, and they said, and I said, oh, God, how many, how many can I talk about? Ten Most, best books starting no, no, with no, Alison no, no, Buleshwar. No, no. Okay, I have to say, I have to talk about yes. yours because Alison Buleshwar was a... Alison Buleshwar took us out of Delhi for the first time, which is Kaiwan's book with us. Till then, we'd only done Delhi authors or people who came from other you know, out, outside <laughs> India and then sort of, uh, and I remember how I found you. It was that magazine in which you were writing. Council of Architecture pieces, magazine. Pieces, Council of Architecture a magazine, which <laughs> the only reason I read it is because my husband's an architect and he used to get that damn magazine at home and he doesn't want to read anything to do with architecture. And I, of course, was, uh, you know, consuming everything. And I was like, gosh. This is a very interesting person who's an architect, but he's also talking about the social history of a neighborhood, you know, and I, this is the kind of person I'd like to publish. And then I remember I sent you some bizarre, I don't know who's the money, did we have emails even? I, I can't like even that, remember yeah, what yeah. it was. And then we met at the tea center, I think, In for Bombay. our first meeting, not knowing what I was going to ask you to write, but then knowing that I wanted you to write. Anyway, and it was, and you know, that book, continues to live and <laughs> thrive and move. Um, and as I said, it took us out of, out of uh, Delhi um, for our author pool. But of course, another very important book was in 2013 when we published the first uh, partition, graphic anthology and <laughs> partition, <laughs> this <laughs> side, that side, uh, restoring partition, because there hadn't <laughs> been a graphic book on partition. I don't know how that's possible even. I mean, at that <laughs> time it was, unthinkable that we were doing the first one with Vishwajyoti Ghosh. And that was a very important moment. Uh, the process was excruciating. We, it was three years in the making. Goethe Institute was our partner and brilliant, brilliant partners. And, uh, and I think two more moments, if I'm allowed, I would mention. One, the big one in 2018, that was not about a particular title. Mm. But when 377 was read down and homosexuality was decriminalized by the Supreme Court, five of our titles were in that judgment. They were cited in that judgment. Uh, and I remember saying to our team, of course we celebrated, and then I said, ha, we've not made any money, we're all broke, but this is legacy. This is, this is something that will be remembered and this is more than enough. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Andrea is showing me the time, but the setup is beautiful. I'm just imagining all the audiences loving this conversation because I can't see the audience, but I'm loving this conversation. So I'm going to still continue for another five, ten minutes because I'm thoroughly enjoying. I'm not going to stop anyone from speaking. And Andrea, now I come to you. So one, one, one question. Uh, and you've done your number as the director of the Italian Cultural Center. We'll ask you to shift roles, but I'm going to recall a very recent conversation uh, that the two of us had. Uh, and here I think uh, it's also the kind of work that you've done as an artist, uh, as a designer. And I think the, the question is, how do you bring 
meaning to what you do. You also deal with intersectionalities in many, many ways. But we were talking about this in the sense of what makes the question of slowness and sensitivity important to all the work we do. I think Paramita spoke of rush. And a half listening, carefully listening. Um, I could be and I found myself in every single voice. And, uh, and I think this is related to time. Um, for quite a, quite a long time in, in my life, I've been fighting, trying to either run away from rush or staying away from stillness. And I remember uh, the moment in which during, during um, actually it was a retreat, this monk told me, look, there's no your time, my time, his time. <laughs> so there is one time, and either you are in it or you are out. And I think that was the first time in which I started to realize that my own personal understanding of life, my way of doing things, resisting what others were expecting me for, to do, start to become important. And, and that's where I started to see every single action of the day as part of the practice. And that's when I also began doing more things. In the house, for instance, mm. you know, mm. the pandemic was an occasion to, the lockdown was an occasion to talk to people or to friends about things you normally don't talk, laundry, <laughs> cooking, True. housekeeping. True. To think that all this is outside oh, yes. the practice, yes. it's very wrong. And so I think now I feel slow in the rush. Mm. I enjoy the rush at times. I really enjoy, I mean, there are times in which I find myself in 12 different projects yes. simultaneously <laughs> and uh, times in which I do one thing and I see that it's not the quantity of things it's actually the space the inner space that is generated to listen to others mm -hmm. or to what life is asking you to that uh, make, makes the difference and, uh, and I value that a lot. So I don't know whether I answered Yes, you yes, yes. No, very, very much. Because I think it was, uh, it was precisely this question. Because I think we all work and think through the rush. We think through the work. I think it's, it's part of that cycle that sort of produces what we are and what our, what our work is. But at the same time, I think uh, what was important for me to sort of think over is to not miss out on that sense that, you know, uh, I read a beautiful line and you share it with a friend. You know, you send a, you, it, today you may just send a photograph of a, from a book you're reading right now to a friend and say, it's so beautiful. And that's just that moment of sharing something a beautiful. Or as I was saying, you know, architects very often design a really small detail with a lot of time and attention, which nobody's going to notice. But you have enjoyed doing that. So that sense of stability and slowness that you found in that one detail, one line in sharing, and that's very important to sort of continue who we are and what we are in, in many, many ways. And yes, so thank you very, very much, uh, Andrea. Should we have audience questions, one or two? Or we Maybe leave it one, to the informal? Really Can I add one thing? Yes. First of all, I'm the bad guy here. This is clear. I, I only produce under pressure. <laughs> so, 
No, I no, all of us only, work under I, pressure. The all of us do. The more pressure, the best pr production. I'm sorry. And I, and I tend to do three or four things at the same, same time. No, I wanted I want to play uh, one thing. I mean, uh, in, in most, um, first of all, thank you, because this is a wonderful panel. <laughs> I definitely am not adequate to. So thank you for putting up such a beautiful thing. Uh, most of what we said today is about the relation be uh, between the individual, the community, and the whole. This is probably the problem today, how to manage this. In my, in my, in my early political times, the, the obsession was how to, I mean, it, Italy, I mean, especially our profession in Italy has always been very political. So the obsession was how to connect the avant-garde and the mass. It's a typical 20th century question. question. Today, probably from what we learned to, to, tonight, it, it should have be reformulated in a different way, but I think it's still there because we don't want to lose democracy, mm -hmm. we don't want to keep promoting democracy. So how to put together all these things is the real thing. But maybe sometimes answers can be found where you don't expect them. So I want to do a second of promotion for Italian culture. <laughs> the one architect what I would like to highlight to you in the show is one woman, probably your age, working in this tiny, ugly village in Sicily, doing only single family. I mean, she would do also cities, but they ask her for single family houses. She was the only Italian ar architect in the 70s and 80s who was close to artists because we were not allowed to talk to artists in that mm -hmm. time because mm -hmm. our masters, that you know, <laughs> they thought they were the artists, no? Aldo Rossi, Scolai, they thought they were. So Maria Giuseppina Grasso Cannizzo, mm -hmm. in the small things she does, you can find a lot of interesting suggestions is how to deal with reality, how to deal with materials, how to deal with nature, how to deal with clients, which is the other side of society, you know, we have to deal with. So thank you for allowing me <laughs> this kind of advertisement thing, but look at her work because she, and she's the only Italian, I mean, this should never be told around, is the only Italian architect I acknowledge real talent to. So, good, thank you. <laughs> On that note, we'll call it a day. Thank you very, very much to all the panelists as the moderator. It's been wonderful, and for me, it's just that I want to hear them again and again, and that's why they're always there on the panels we put together, and thank you very much. It's been a great evening. Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Kaivan. I think it was beautiful. <coughs> there was a lot of goodness in the conversation, and there was a lot of voice seeking news. So there is one more interpretation of good news. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient. And I'm sure you're going to walk out with a lot of good news. Mm -hmm.